I don't need to say much about the events that have riveted us on television and on the internet. Um, anyone who in some future time writes the history would not end the story today. It was in the midst of this history. It's happening and it's all at once a ripe time to have a conversation like this. But we know that it, it's possible that the most dramatic events are ahead of us. <coughs> Today we have six distinguished speakers who know a lot about the internal region, the, the internal politics of the region, internal societies, and also about the international context. So our first speaker is Juan Cole. He's the Richard P. Mitchell Collegiate Professor of History. And I want you to give a warm welcome to Juan. Thank you very much, Ken, and thank you all for coming out. You know, Hosni Mubarak, the president of Egypt, is an Air Force Marshal, and he's been there since 1981. And if anyone knows anything serious about Egypt, you know that the Egyptians are distinguished by their sense of humor. They are the ones that generate the jokes in the Middle East. So one of the jokes they tell about Hosni Mubarak and have told for years is that, you know, he is getting on in age. He's 82. He's been there forever. So some of his advisors are said to have come to him behind the scenes. And they said to him, Mr. President, don't you think it's time for you to say goodbye to the Egyptian people? And they say that Mubarak's face gets this look of utter astonishment on it, just complete surprise. And he says, why? Where are they going? <laughs> and you'll note that the joke has been borne out in reality, because uh, if there was an opportunity for him to say goodbye, it was last Friday, and he didn't take it. Mubarak represents a complex regime in Egypt, a, a complex and large bureaucracy. It, the regime originates in a military coup in 1952. And it really has only had four leaders since 1952. General Mohammed Naguib, who quickly was, uh, uh, was replaced by uh, Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser. Abdel Nasser had a long run. Uh, he, he, he ruled until his death in 1970. Abdel Nasser increasingly favored socialist policies, and he created a very large socialist bureaucracy. Uh, John Waterbury uh, estimated that at its height, the Egyptian public sector was actually larger than some of those in Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, so it was a, a, a country whose economy was very much in government hands. Uh, but, and to, to be fair, it had some successes because Egypt had not industrialized. Uh, it was a largely a agrarian society. It was uh, locked into growing cotton, which after the revolution in synthetics had become less and less valuable. Uh, and so it was, and, and then there are problems with, you know, just growing one crop like that. Monocultures are bad for the soil, and so there were problems in productivity, problems in salinization of the soil. Uh, so being a large cotton farm was Egypt's fate for m the late 19th and most of the uh, early 20th century. Abdel Nasser industrialized the place. He started factories. And um, he succeeded in, in doubling the average per capita income of Egyptians between 1960 and 1970 because of this governmental, uh, government-led industrialization drive. But uh, as we all know, history is somewhat dialectical. And uh, when you build a lot of buildings, you need uh, uh, contractors. You need the Donald Trump types who will build the buildings. The government didn't actually socialize that part of things. And so Abdel Nasser, through the 60s and then it continued afterwards, created a huge class of uh, new millionaires who were building contractors and other kinds of government contractors. Because as we all know, when you have a big government sector in our own 
Pentagon and, and some other government agencies are a good example of this, there's a tendency then to subcontract a lot of the work, which then creates private wealth. And by the 70s, the private wealth had become substantial, and the military ruler at the time, Anwar Sadat, who, who succeeded Abdel Nasser, moved to the right. He moved away from socialism to, uh, uh, to uh, more right-wing policies. That meant getting rid of the Soviet Union, allying with the United States, opening up the Egyptian economy, beginning a, a process of privatization. And so Amnur Sadat's moves in this regard and, and, and making a peace treaty with Israel because the Egyptian economy couldn't flourish as long as there were these constant wars and uncertainty. So for the new business class, uh, Egypt was moved into uh, a position of uh, alliance with the United States, uh, uh, a relative uh, alliance with, uh, with Israel, uh, and uh, its, its tourist sector boomed. 11 million tourists came last year. Uh, it's, it, business investment is way up. Uh, the, the, the city of Cairo is sprouting all of these hotels and, and uh, other enterprises. Uh, there's a lot of money floating around. New, new suburbs of Cairo or, or, or sections of Cairo are being built, which they locally they call the Beverly Hills sections. Uh, so there's an enormous amount of wealth around. I was in, in Cairo in, in May, uh, and I, I wanted to do some, some bourgeois tourism. So I went to the new, to the new mall, city mall in Nus, Nus, Medina Nasser. Uh, it's five city blocks, and I got lost. You know how you're walking in a mall, you see a store, you're kind of interested in it, you think, well, I'm not that interested in it, maybe I'll stop in on my way back. I never could find it again. I thought I might go to a movie, but I couldn't find the cinema. Uh, I don't know if any Egyptians are able to buy things in that mall. There seemed to be a lot of Gulf Arabs uh, from the oil states visiting, and the Egyptians, I think, were doing a lot of window shopping. Uh, so the, the country, as it's moved into this mode of a kind of alliance of the military regime with the new business class, uh, has created enormous inequalities. It's created new opportunities. But what I would argue is that the political system stagnated, became sclerotic. It was Mubarak. It was Mubarak's son, Gamal. It was the cronies of Mubarak and his son, Gamal. It was a handful of influential high military officers who made the important decisions about the economy. There was growth for the first time in a long time in the, in the zeros. There was five, six, seven percent growth. And it created a revolution of rising expectations. Uh, when you've got, you know, rising expectations and you've got a blocked middle class that can't make its way in, then you get a lot of trouble. The other thing that happened was that as textiles began taking off and you had investment in the industrial sector, uh, the working class became more important. And it is very badly paid and is very badly treated. Uh, Egypt uh, is still, in some ways, uh, has a lot of feudal attitudes. I had a, a colleague, uh, Samer Shahata, who did field work on the floor of an Egyptian factory. And you know, the workers can't talk to the, uh, the managers face to face, eye to eye. They have to demonstrate a kind of body language of subservience. Uh, and um, so the idea of factory workers striking, demanding their rights. You know, the Egyptian elite would swat that down. Two years ago, it happened. Uh, the April 6th movement, which was an alliance of the working class, the textile workers, and the new middle class promoted these strikes in, in Egypt, and um, uh, the government uh, crushed them. The Muslim Brotherhood, the main Muslim fundamentalist organization, declined to join in that movement. They're right of cinder. They're right wing. They don't support uh, uh, anything but private property. They had objected to Abdel Nasser's land reform. So uh, that movement was split. It was the new middle class and the workers who, who joined, uh, and the youth uh, who joined to, to make for it. And the April 6th movement of two years ago was the kernel of the current uprising. It was the April 6th movement of factory workers and the new middle class youth. Uh, Google and, and, and GM, uh, in American terms, that made for this uprising. And of course, lots of other people joined in. Over, over time, 
the ruling party through which the military and the business elite run Egypt, which is a kind of one-party state, the National Democratic Party, which is three lies. Um, uh, the, the National Democratic Party uh, uh, had some small rivals, and, and you know, the elections in Egypt were kind of like the elections in old time Chicago. The machine always won, the dead could vote, and the only question is how badly you'd be defeated if you ran against it. Uh, so, uh, there, but there were some small parties uh, that got into parliament. There's a leftist party, Tagamo, uh, there's um, a, a movement, a new movement of the zeros, Kifaya, enough, which was enough of Mubarak. And that split, and you had uh, Ayman Noor and the, and the Tomorrow Party came out of it, and Ayman Noor ran against Mubarak in 2005. He got about 7 or 8 percent of the vote, was allowed to get that much. Um, so th those new parties or old left parties also have been very important to organizing the youth. But for the most part, this is, this is a spontaneous uprising of networked youth. And, and in, in Arabic, in Egypt, they're calling it Thawrat uh, al-Shabaab, the youth revolution. And the median age in Egypt is 24. Uh, back in the late 60s, when my generation was making a lot of trouble, the median age of the United States was 25. It's now over 30. Uh, so obviously, the, the large bulge of youth is important to this. What do they want? They want an opening. They want an end to one party rule. They want free communications. They want an end to the Facebook police. Uh, they want economic opportunity. And the working class shouldn't be forgotten in this. They want the factory workers want to be better paid, better respected. This is a largely left wing revolution. And because it's a left wing revolution, the US corporate media cannot understand it. They keep looking, you know, are there, is there any ethnicity here? Could there possibly be like uh, uh, the equivalent of, um, you know, some, some ethnic group that's marginalized? Or maybe they're Muslim fundamentalists. Maybe that's what's going on. The only narratives the corporate media allows for an event like this are ethnic or religious. They don't want to talk about the working class and class, because, of course, we managed to get rid of the American working class. Nobody says they are. And only 9% of workers here are unionized. But that's what's going on in Egypt. It's, it's a revolution from the left. And whether it will succeed or not is still very much up in the air. And, and the, the military and the business classes, the people with the billions at the top who have benefited so much from this system, are not going to go quietly. Uh, they tried cracking down hard on, on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, that didn't work, A, and B, it produced a very bad international reaction. Uh, there's some evidence that they now are going to gradually, behind the scenes, move in tanks, prevent further demonstrations, round up people at night. Uh, so they're going to try to pull an Iran. And that's the big question, is, is can they tamp this thing down over time, or will it have staying power? Egypt is losing $300 million a year in its economy. Every day there are these uh, demonstrations and strikes. If the demonstrators can keep this going sooner or later, even the business class is going to go to Omar Suleiman, the new vice president, and say, Mubarak's not worth it. And that's the big question, is will that happen? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Susan Waltz, Professor of Public Policy at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I have spent the last uh, 30 years um, visiting and studying, following the smaller country of Tunisia, where it all started. And I, I'm, I'd like to, uh, to believe that you'd all turn out uh, just if we were going to be talking about Tunisia today. Um, but I, I, I think that. Uh, what has happened in Tunisia has had obviously a lot of significance for the for the rest of the uh, for the region, and uh, we'll probably want to put the Tunisian experience in a comparative uh, context. <coughs> People are, are calling the Tunisian experience the Jasmine uh, Revolution, and are are talking about it as an opening in the Middle East, and um, are. Uh, speaking of Ben Ali, the the erstwhile president of Tunisia, as the uh, as a dictator, as um, uh, an oppressive ruler, and I want to take in my short presentation the long view of uh, the Tunisian experience, and remind people if they had known it, and inform you if you hadn't, that when Ben Ali came into power 
1987, he engaged in a bloodless clue, uh, a coup. Many people said that it was bloodless because the former president, Habib Bourguiba, had no blood left in him. Um, he was uh, notorious for basically uh, leading parades and having people have to hold his hands up because he was so frail and so incompetent at the end. And the countryside, a huge sigh of relief when the um, former Minister of Interior and um, uh, defense official um, Ben Ali moved in in the bloodless coup and removed uh, uh, Habib Bourguiba. Ben Ali was awarded a human rights prize in his first year of rule. The UN decided to set up the Arab world's human rights organization in Tunisia because of uh, the new opening that took place there. Um, ben Ali, in his first years of rule, um, abolished the constitutional provision for president for life, which was subsequently more or less reinstated. Um, he abolished security courts, emptied the prisons. It was the period of uh, fleurissement, of a flowering in Tunisia, uh, and many people were understandably very, very optimistic about the future of Tunisia at that point. And so when we look at what's going on in Tunisia today, I think it's important to keep that historical perspective. Um, and we have to also ask what changed that the world, um, what, what the world once saw as, as a very open uh, leader and as a hopeful uh, opportunity for democracy to really install itself in the, the Arab world, what happened to reverse that course? And I think if we take, if we look at Tunisia's history, uh, the 200 or so years of, of independence in, uh, in that region, you can identify two big threads or strands uh, of in, in the political culture. One that, I. I as a political scientist, I call rationalism, but that we may want to associate with, with more accessible terms like reform or pluralism or liberalism. And then on the other side, a strand of um, a personalism or uh, cult of the personality. And Tunisia has vacillated over time between these two. Both threads can be traced uh, in parallel form through the, through the country's history. When the first president after uh, independence, uh, Habib Bourguiba, uh, uh, ran the country for close to 30, well, more than 30 years, um, he ultimately developed a cult of, of the personality, a cult of personality and, and that was what people thought was overthrown when Ben Ali came into power. And Ben Ali, those of us who looked at his, him in his early uh, years, the, the analysis, the common analysis for Ben Ali was that he had, he had no social backing. He had really no, um, no class, no particular segment of society that would really back him, and that he needed to um, bring in the human rights activist. He brought several of them into his cabinet. He needed to liberalize in order to build a power base. And that lasted for some short period of time, but then very quickly, um, he moved to actually begin to develop these personalistic uh, uh, um, bases of, of power. What, were, what did they look like? Um, they, they really took two forms. They, they were the incursion of family and associates into the various structures of society so that the Ben Ali and the Trabelsi families over time profited from the uh, Washington consensus inspired uh, economic reform so that many of the state enterprises that were privatized came into the control directly or indirectly of the Ben Ali family and his wife wife's family, uh, a hairdresser, uh, his wife was a hairdresser and uh, left the country uh, a billionaire, basically, and did that essentially by um, family members uh, basically brokering many of the deals that um, came in from, from uh, financing from the Emirates and other parts of the, the Saudi uh, Peninsula. So. Mm -hmm. 
uh, th that was um, w that was one of the threads. The other thread was through a cultivation of fear, fear of Isl radical Islam, fear of Algeria, um, and basically um, <coughs> bringing in some of the people who, in other uh, circumstances, would have been more inclined to oppose him. He neutralized his opposition, and that really kept the country going for some uh, 30 years. I think what most Tunisians um, who are, would identify themselves as a sort of a middle class, well-educated, felt that over the last 20, 25 years, or last 20 years after the first three years of the Ben Ali regime, they, the one word that rises to the top of their political experiences that they felt infantilized, that they felt like that their intelligence was basically, they, they were followed, um, when, when they dared uh, step out of line and they felt like that their possibilities of engaging in intelligent discourse about their country's affairs were extremely limited. The papers were um, uh, written in what they called the language of wood, a wooden language. Uh, basically, Ben Ali opened, uh, cut the ribbon on this, Ben Ali traveled to this part of the country, and that was all that you could read in the news on a daily basis. And it, it appears that the, the budget numbers uh, that the parliament looked at were pretty much um, rigged. The whole country was really cut off, the political classes were cut off from, from any kind of a discourse. Um, so where does that leave us today? Despite all of this um, kind of a, a, a gloomy look at the past, I'm cautiously optimistic because what we have in Tunisia right now is the rationalist reform peer, uh, phase that is, that is uh, um, uh, rising. The, um, uh, the government that is, uh, the custodial government that has been put in place until elections take place is largely supplied by technocrats uh, who, who are very well educated and, and very capable. And the, um, th they face a number of challenges, to be clear, and let me, um, let me just sort of list what those challenges are and then quickly say why I think that there, there's still a chance of success for this uh, Jasmine Re revolution. Um, the, the big challenges, the two main challenges I would say that they face is, first of all, dismantling the, uh, power, the old power structure, which is, includes the party, the police, and a, um, a goon squad that is equivalent to the Tonton Makud, if you remember them from Haiti, of uh, something like 150,000 uh, informally employed uh, state security officers who have been do basically been kept off the streets by following people around and, and beating them up or, or uh, otherwise <coughs> harassing them for the last uh, several years. They are still out there in the streets and have not yet been been, been fully brought under control, and the the, um, the RCD party itself is going to be dismantled, but um, it has had a monopoly on the, the power structures, and so that's one of the big challenges. The other one is um, the economy. Um, the unemployment rate among the working class has been actually fairly low at about 5 percent, but the unemployment rate among university-educated people has been around 35 to 50 percent in various parts of the country, and that's clearly a huge challenge. Um, and add to that that about 8 percent of the country's receipts come from tourism and that many of the larger tour operators from Europe have suspended operations. It's going to be a very, very big challenge for Tunisia to, to recover. Um, so those are the two big challenges that they face, but the good news is that the elite in the country are staying, and moreover, many of the uh, elite who have been in Europe are are returning, and um, and I don't mean by elite the those who were associated with Ben Ali, but those who had had actually um, taken harbor elsewhere during the last several years because they found no place for themselves. So there is the the press is opening up. Um, and I think Tunisia will also offer us an opportunity to see how a more moderate um, um, version or uh, variety of, of Islamism can take part in the political um, 
in the in the whole political plan panoply, and that um, the Islamists will show that they have a a place and a, and a role to play, and maybe Tunisia will um, assert itself as what I think it can be, the Costa Rica of the Middle East. Stop here and. <coughs> Okay, our next speaker is uh, Mark Tesler. Mark is the Samuel J. Eldersfeld Collegiate Professor of Political Science. He's the Vice Provost for International Affairs. Well, I add my thanks to uh, Ken and the Institute for organizing this. Um, not surprisingly, I've been thinking a lot in the last few weeks about the time that I, the year I spent in Egypt and the several years that I lived in Tunisia and studied there. And um, we've been asked to keep our remarks short, so I don't think I have time to properly tell the joke about Mubarak that I heard when I was in Egypt. Uh, but if you know uh, the postage stamp joke, maybe that will ring a bell. And if I have some time at the end, maybe I will tell it, or maybe someone will ask it. It's, it's actually much harsher than, uh, than Juan's, and I, th and, I think, and I think fits where it is today. Uh, I was also thinking about Tunisia. Uh, I was living in Tunisia uh, during the 1984 riots. Uh, which maybe today seem a little bit pale in comparison, but in fact were national riots that shook the regime and set in motion, uh, not directly, but somewhat, uh, at least somewhat indirectly, uh, the events that led to Bourguiba being uh, phased out and uh, Ben Ali coming in. And uh, uh, also, if I had time, I'd love to tell some stories about what it was like to be there at the time. Um, there were uh, massive protests, and, and, uh, and, and what comes through is something that, uh, that both speakers really touched on, that uh, it's, uh, it's about uh, injustice and it's about hopelessness. Uh, the country has resources. Some of the problems aren't going to go away overnight. I mean, you heard about the youth bulge that, uh, that uh, Juan mentioned. It exists in Tunisia as well. And there is going to be unemployment. But people are really angry about the fundamental unfairness that there is resources. You can see people lining up in front of the Sheraton Hotel for $100,000 weddings, uh, and then people are being paid a few, uh, a, a few uh, dinars a day to, uh, to stand guard. Uh, it's about the lack, it's about the hopelessness, the lack of redress, uh, and the fundamental unfairness of it. I think uh, if people felt that, yes, we have problems, but uh, the burdens are being shared equitably, and uh, yes, we can't do everything overnight, but the resources we have are being invested so that things will be better for our kids, there'd be a lot more patience. That's not the perception that, that, that people have. And uh, if you've been there during those periods or even talked to people subsequently, uh, there uh, are, are a lot of really interesting and, 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 and touching stories uh, about the way that expresses itself. <clears throat> I'd be happy to come back to either of those, but uh, what I really want to do is talk about something different for the few minutes I have. Uh, and that's about uh, how people are thinking about is how, how people in uh, the Arab world, in the Arab Middle East, are thinking about Islam in the context of all of this. Uh, there's an awful lot of misinformation, maybe sometimes based on ignorance, maybe sometimes based on deliberate misconception. I really don't know. But some of the things you hear about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists and Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, is that the same? Is it different? Uh, there's an awful lot of Islamophobia in this country. Uh, and uh, it really colors, at least in part, the way we look at events. Well, I've been doing research on this. And this is not the place for a research report. But I want to use the few minutes I have to give you some findings from the public opinion research I've been doing. I'm working with uh, a group of Arab scholars. There are two of us in the US. And all the rest of the partners are from different uh, Middle Eastern Arab countries. <clears throat> We're doing surveys in a number of countries. We're currently in 10 countries. We've got data from eight so far. Uh, we've been trying repeatedly to do it in Egypt. And we have not been able to get permission, but we think now we'll be able to do it. And we haven't been able, to, and we haven't done it in Tunisia, but uh, we're now in conversations about doing it in Tunisia. But we have, we do have large nationally representative probability-based samples in eight countries: two in the Gulf, Algeria, Morocco, in the Maghreb, Yemen, Palestine, uh, Lebanon, Jordan. So we've got a very good representation. These are very good samples, and I think it's fair to say, uh, especially since they're implemented and designed in collaboration with people from the region, that the findings we have uh, offer some, some, some meaningful food for thought. 
And I would offer the three or four following conclusions trying to generalize from this uh, rather large and ongoing project. <clears throat> First of all, um, the population is about split. It varies a little bit from country to country and a little bit over time, but about 50-50 in those who want Islam to play. First of all, actually, I should say the first finding is that there's overwhelming support, 85 or 90 percent, across all the surveys. Uh, we've done about 14 so far uh, for democracy. Nobody is talking about a nobody is talking about going back to the Nasser system, and nobody is talking about some sort of an Iranian theology. Uh, it's, it's, it's democracy they want. About half the population, pretty much everywhere, it depends a little bit on which question you ask, but the finding that comes through very clearly, the population is pretty evenly divided between those who want democracy and it should be secular democracy. Islam is fine, it's important, it's our religion, it's important to us, but leave it out of politics. It's bad for politics, it's bad for the religion, it's my private faith. And about the other half wants uh, Islam to play a role in political affairs. Not in some sort of, of, of a theocratic context, I'm trying to make that clear, but that they do think that in some meaningful way, uh, Islam should play a role. And there are different ways in which people express that. Uh, so that's the second finding, support for democracy, but uh, a division on whether Islam is a part of that political formula. The third is if you compare these two groups, those who want secular democracy and those who want democracy with Islam, they are virtually identical on a whole range of other attitudes and values. Those who want Islam as part of their democratic formula are somewhat more conservative on some issues, particularly relating to women, although not universally, and the difference isn't that big, but you can see a difference. They do have a somewhat, a somewhat more conservative social agenda. But on political questions, on treatment of minorities, on issues of economic justice, uh, on the importance of democracy, on a whole wide range of things, uh, on social relations, social capital, for those who know what these terms mean, uh, there isn't any difference. So those who support Islam come uh, out of the mainstream. They're not, some sort, they're not off with a distinctive mindset or a particularly different, distinctive, maybe even narrow, more conservative point of view. Uh, they're simply people that think Islam should play an important role. And it's not necessarily all that different than certain, certain tendencies in the US about how pe people who feel our public policy should be informed by, 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 by certain kinds of Christian values or certain factions in Israel that think we're a Jewish state, so that has to mean something. Uh, but again, it's a very mainstream movement. And the point I'm trying to make is that some of the notions you hear, I guess they're extreme and maybe nobody in this audience takes them seriously, but uh, we're gonna have Sharia law in the US tomorrow and we're gonna have the caliphate the day after. Uh, Everything we know about how people in these countries are thinking about their own religion bears no relationship to those kinds of stereotypes that were offered. And the final point I would make uh, in terms of what's coming out of this research is that if you ask, well, what are some of the circumstances that lead people to be in the group that want Islam with democracy, democracy with Islam, as opposed to secular democracy, one of the things that, uh, there are a number of things, but one of the things that predisposes people toward that point of view, to be on that half of the normative divide on this question, is how, whether they feel the government is doing a good job or not, and those who are more, uh, more neg negative in their judgments about the government are more likely to believe that Islam should play a political role. Maybe not surprising, because the governments about which they have these negative attitudes but I would like to tell my joke about if I had time, uh, is, uh, uh, is our, our secular nationalist authoritarian regimes. And that relate, and if we divide the countries up into those that are somewhat free, have a certain limited, but nonetheless reasonable um, uh, openness for political rights, there's freedom of the press and things like that, and those that are more restrictive, the relationship that I just mentioned becomes stronger in the more restrictive countries. The degree to which negative attitudes toward the government is likely to predispose an individual to be on the democracy with Islam as opposed to the secular democracy side of the equation, that relationship increases, or the importance of attitude towards the government in, in predicting which category you're in increases if the government itself is more authoritarian. Well, I'm gonna, I can see uh, I've used up my time, so maybe you won't hear the joke, or maybe we'll hear it later. Thanks. Our next speaker is Nadine Naber.
She's an assistant professor of American culture and women's studies here at the University of Michigan. Thank you. Thank you to the International Institute for organizing this important event. Uh, I have uh, personal and academic uh, connections. Can you hear me? Yes, OK. Uh, with uh, what's going on on the ground in Egypt. And I'm going to begin with a YouTube clip for you from Asma Mahfouz. She is a 26-year-old woman whose January 18th vlog is said to have helped mobilize the million that turned up in Cairo and the thousands of others on January 25th in other cities. البعض من المصريين ولعوا في نفسهم قالوا يمكن يحصل زي اللي حصل في تونس يمكن نبقى بلد حرة بلد فيها عدل بلد فيها كرامة بلد الإنسان فيها إنسان بجد مش عايش كحيوان النهاردة واحد منهم مات وأعلنوا موته لقيت كل الناس واقفة بتقول لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ده ما تكافر ده ما تعايز شهرة يا جماعة حرام عليكم أنا نزلت وكتبت إن أنا بنت وحنزل ميدان التحرير وهقف لوحدي وهرفع يابطة يمكن الناس تحس وكتبت رقم يمكن الناس تنزل محدش نزل إلا ثلاث شباب محدش نزل إلا ثلاث شباب وطلعت عربيات أمن مركزي وكان الباقي جاي في السكة في الشارع ومش هولع في نفسي لو الحكومة عايزة تولع فيا تيجي تولع وكل واحد في البلد دي شايف نفسه راجل يبقى ينزل إنه كل واحد في البلد دي بيقول البنات اللي بتنزل مظاهرة بتتبهدل وما يصحش إن هي تنزل وحرام يخلي عنده نخوة ورجولة وينزل يوم 25 كل واحد بيقول العدد هيبقى نزل قليل وما فيش حاجة هتحصل عايز أقول له أنت السبب في اللي احنا فيه أيوة أنت السبب وأنت مدان زيك زي الرئيس زي أي فاسد زي أي ضابط بيضربنا وبيبهدلنا أنت السبب نزولك معنا هيفرق ومش بيفرق حاجة بسيطة لا بيفرق كتير كلامك مع جيرانك ومع صحابك ومع زمايلك ومع أهلك وإنك تشجعهم إن هم ينزلوا حتى لو تنزلوا في منطقة مش في مدان التحرير ولا قدام اللازغلي ولا في أي حتة بس تنزلوا تسجلوا موقف وتقولوا إحنا بني أدمين ده بيفرق وعادك في بيتك بتتفرج أو بتشوف على الفيسبوك وبتطلع على الأخبار ده بيبهدلنا إحنا بيبهدلنا أنا لو أنت عندك كرامة وأنت إنسان وراجل في البلد دي يبقى تنزل تنزل تحميني وتحمي أي بنت تنزل لو فضلت قاعد في البيت تبقى تستحق كل اللي بيجارك ومش أنت لوحدك أنت هتبقى مدان أنت هتبقى مسؤول وأنت اللي عليك ذنب كبير قوي ذنب البلد دي وذنب كل واحد عايش فيها أنت هتبقى شايل مسؤولية كل واحد نزل الشارع عشان يطالب بحق وانت قاعد في بيتك انزل البيت ابعت مسجات لصحابك اكتب عن نت في كل حتة وعي أنت عارف الدايرة بتاعتك عمارتك لوحدها وصحابك وقريبك بس قل لهم انزل معي نزلهم خمسة ولا عشرة لو كل واحد فينا نزل خمسة وعشرة ونزل بيهم لمدان التحرير أو مدان اللازغلي أو في أي حتة عشوائية حتى ويتكلم الناس ويقول لهم بقى كفاية بدل ما نولع في نفسنا تعالوا نتكلم ونسجل موقف ده هيفق وهيفق كتير قوي اوعى تقول ما فيش أمل طول ما انت بتقول ما فيش أمل هيبقى ما فيش أمل طول ما انت بتنزل وبتسجل موقف هيبقى فيه أمل اوعى تخاف من الحكومة خاف من ربنا so I'm going to have some slides going in the background. So hopefully you can listen to me while you watch. Esma's vlog and the stories of many Egyptian women offer up a challenge to two key questions framing US discourse on the January 25th revolution. The two questions that we hear in the US, where are the women? And but what if Islamic extremists take over? Scholar Paul Ahmad argues that the revolution began as a protest led by labor unions, many women-based labor unions in manufacturing cities. The women now holding down Tahrir Square as we speak are of all ages and social groups, and their struggle cannot be explained through Orientalist tropes that reduce Arab women to passive victims of culture or religion. They are active participants in a grassroots struggle against poverty and state corruption, rigged elections, repression, torture, and police brutality. They are leading marches, attending the wounded, and participating in identity checks of state-supported thugs. They have helped create human shields to protect, protect Egyptian Antiquities Museum, the Arab League headquarters, and one another. They have helped organize neighborhood watch groups and committees to protect private and public property nationwide. They are fighting dictatorship among millions of people, not guided by any one sect or political party, and united under one slogan. We want an end to this regime. Master Mims, protest rapper in the UK, best represents my point in the lyrics to her song. 
back down Mubarak, where she states, first give me a job, then let's talk about my hijab. And for anyone wondering about the oppression of Arab women, these women have indeed suffered. Nuha Radwan was attacked beaten half to death by Bai Mubarak thugs who ripped her shirt open and has stitches in her head. Several women and men are now martyrs, over 200. Amira killed by a police officer, Liz hit by a police car, Sally Zahran hit by a Mubarak thug in the back of the head with a bat, went home to sleep and never woke up just last week. All of these stories. Since the demonstrations pushed the police out of the center of Cairo, several women have made statements like this. It's the first time I have never been harassed in Cairo. Egyptian police are notorious for sexual harassment and violence against women. Some Egyptian women are on the front lines of the war over ideas, fighting the Egyptian state TV and exposing the contradictions between US discourse on democracy and US practice as the Egyptian regime pays thugs to run over peaceful demonstrators, stab them, and kill them, many women are challenging Obama and Clinton's advice that both sides need to refrain from violence. And many are outraged over the US's unanswered loyalty to Mubarak, as well as Obama's apparent backing of Vice President Omar Suleiman. Aida Saif al-Dawla, a woman of Tahrir Square and leading human rights activist with Nadim Center for Torture Survivors, is angry that Western leaders and media call Suleiman a distinguished and respected man. She has spent years seeking to expose his key role as the coordinator of the CIA's extraordinary rendition program, an extrajudicial procedure in which suspected terrorists are transferred illegally to a country such as Egypt that is known to use torture during interrogation. In one case of a Pakistani man, Habib, the CIA sent him to Egypt, to Suleiman. Habib was then repeatedly zapped with high voltage electricity, immersed in water to his nostrils, beaten, his fingers broken, and he was hung from metal hooks. After Suleiman's men extracted Habib's confession, he was transferred back to US custody, where he eventually was imprisoned at Guantanamo. As Egyptian America media pundit Muna Tahawi puts it, US stability comes at the expense of freedom and dignity of the people of my or any country. Of course, a democratic Egypt would benefit women. The government recently passed a law restricting the work of civil society organizations, many relating to the needs of women. Widespread human rights violations, including intense forms of harassment and violence against women, which many organizations in Egypt have well documented. Of course, we have learned from history that women are often pushed back to the sidelines after the revolution is over. So rather than asking, where are the women, we might ask, why has the US media focused on images of men? And in the period to come, how might the voices of the women of Tahrir remain center stage? What are the possibilities for a democrat democratization of rights in Egypt, all civic rights in which women's participation, the rights of women, family law, and the right to organize, protest, and express freedom of speech remain central? What are the possibilities for international solidarity with Egyptian women amidst the war of ideas and for recognizing Arab women and men as rightful agents of their own discourses and destinies? And only um, how can we begin to conceptualize the call from Ahs Asma Mahfouz beyond dominant US discourses? as well as the, what you've seen, what I've been sharing with you about the mobilization of Egyptian women today. How can we begin to conceptualize the mobilization of Egyptian women or stand in solidarity? Thank you. So our next speaker is um, Phil Potter. He's an assistant professor at the Gerald R. School of Public Policy. Our four school of public policy. I forgot that. 
We're on a first name basis with yeah. President Ford. <laughs> um, so I am not an expert in the politics of the region. So what I wanted to do is take a slightly different perspective on this uh, and talk a little bit about the role uh, that media has played in this situation, uh, uh, talk a little bit about US coverage, uh, and the implications for foreign policy uh, moving forward. So I think there are sort of three key trends that are worth keeping an, keeping an eye on as we move forward. Uh, both uh, as we look at what's going on in the Middle East and sort of the broader uh, context for autocracies in general. Um, it's been sort of widely noted that, the, that a lot of the reason that this has turned from uh, you know, perhaps just a local issue in Tunisia into a broader uh, regional issue are, are changes in the media. Right? And I think a lot of people have in, taken a very sort of simplistic view of this and said, well, you know, the internet changes everything. People can get information. They can communicate. Um, but at this point, the, the internet isn't new. Right? The internet's been around for a while. People have been on the internet in these regions. Um, and things ha didn't necessarily spark at that particular moment. Um, what I think has really changed is the mixture between information, uh, communication, and sort of entertainment on the internet. Right? So it, it turns out that censoring hard news on the internet is a relatively trivial task. Right? It's not that difficult to control the flow of, of hard information. <laughs> Um, and a lot of the reason it's not that hard to do is not that many people at a mass level are, are looking for that type of information. It's not a mass phenomenon to go read dissident blogs or to try to get translated New York Times stories. What is a mass phenomenon <coughs> is things like Facebook, right? Um, and it's this mix between uh, the media that people use for entertainment, the media that people use for communication, and information and politi politicization that's really sort of changed the ball game, I think. Um, author author authoritarian regimes can't just sort of crack down and turn these technologies off uh, preemptively, right? It's not really a feasible thing to do because people want these things, right? And they want them at a mass level, right? Um, and it turns out, experience is showing us that turning them off once trouble arises is sort of too little too late. Right? We've seen uh, Iran try this and, and largely fail. We've seen Egypt try this and largely fail. Once people are on the streets, it's too late. We had revolutions before the internet and Facebook, and we'll have them afterwards. Uh, so I think this is a, a real challenge for author authoritarian regimes, and it's one that certainly countries like China are taking careful <coughs> note of. Um, the second thing that I think is a trend worth paying attention to in this regard is the fact that the international media, right, international news networks, have really become kind of active participants in this conflict in a way that we, we haven't really seen before. Right? So we've seen uh, you know, and Anderson Cooper sort of get out there in the square and whine a lot about getting smacked around a little bit. Um, that's you know, uh, small in comparison to you know, the role that Al Jazeera has played here as sort of a, a, a almost an active uh, party to this, this conflict. Right? This has been sort of Al Jazeera's uh, sort of international coming out party in a lot of ways. Um, the third thing that I, I think we should take note of is the nature of US coverage of this conflict. Right? Um, we've seen uh, sustained sort of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of this on the news networks uh, for a remarkably long time for something that doesn't sort of involve the active engagement of US forces or US casualties or uh, things of that sort. Um, and I, I think that, that sort of matters, right? You know, CNN, who's sort of been at the lead uh, on this, has gotten a massive sort of ratings bump. And we all know that, that uh, CNN ratings are sort of a John Stewart punchline. So the fact that they're able to sort of lead the way on this is, is surprising and sort of impressive that the American people have been so engaged with this this particular story. Um, the reason for this is fairly clear, right? The imagery is arresting. Uh, it, it, it makes for just very dramatic coverage. You don't get a better sort of uh, image of kind of the old versus the new than young tech savvy protesters fighting off people on camelback, right? So the, the imagery is, is sort of amazing. But the upshot is that this is arguably the first sort of sustained, positive, differentiated coverage of the Arab world that we've gotten in the mainstream media in the US since 9-11, right? 
And those sorts of things uh, make a big difference. It allows uh, the American electorate to sort of uh, have a more nuanced view, to differentiate groups, to understand that these countries are not indeed monolithic. Um, and that in turn sort of puts pressure on, on US foreign policy. Um, I think this is also, as a result of that, sort of one of the first opportunities for careful discussion of the role that Islam and Islamists play in these societies, right? Um, I thought the coverage of, of Mubarak's interview was particularly interesting. I think having him try to play that fear card on us uh, really sort of changed the nature of the discussion a little bit. Um, so I think the result, we're, we're starting to see you know, little pieces of it coming out already. There, this puts pressure uh, on the administration, right? This is not something that's happening outside of the public's view. The public is, is watching the administration's reaction to this. Um, and uh, as a result, I think the Obama administration has had very little choice but to orient towards the Egyptian people as opposed to their leadership, right? So in his, uh, at least rhetorically, so in his first sort of big public speech on this, uh, he went on for about five minutes. And in those five minutes, he uttered the phrase, the Egyptian people, eight times, right? So this is clear, that, that was the punchline. That was the, the, the media soundbite that was supposed to come out of this, was that we're on the side of the Egyptian people. Um, so in sum, I think there are some important shifts going, uh, going on underway, both in sort of the broader uh, way that, that media is interacting uh, with popular movements, um, and in this particular case, uh, with the coverage that it's receiving inside the United States. Thank you. Okay, our sixth and final speaker is Joshua Cole. He's an associate professor of history here at the University of Michigan. I am the lesser of the two Coles in the history department. <laughs> no relation. Um, Thank you again to Ken for organizing this very important event. I'm very pleased to see so many people as uh, the rest of the panelists are. Um, I, I am also not a specialist in the Middle East. I'm a French historian by training, but I have some interest in French Algeria, and that's brought, uh, uh, it's, uh, focused my work on North Africa in recent years. So um, I, I want to start maybe by expanding a little bit on some of the uh, comments that Philip made about the way that we have been getting these stories in the media, um, and then talk a little bit about North Africa in the time that remains. I'll try and be as quickly as, as quick as possible. I'm sure, sure you have some questions. It seems to me that there's really two kinds of stories that we're getting in the media about these um, uh, protest movements in the Middle East. Uh, on the one hand, there are the um, kind of country by country stories, and I think stories is the important word here, about the origins of these most recent popular protest movements. And in each case, um, both in the print and I think in the television media, there is this look and focus for a spark, as if this explains the moment, explains the timing. Um, so we have the story of the uh, fruit seller um, who uh, immolated himself in Tunisia. We have the story that's been circulating in recent weeks about, um, I believe his name is Khaled Saeed in Egypt, the young man who was beaten so uh, badly by the security police. Um, and, the and, and I want to point out that um, you know, in the best uh, of these stories uh, come from uh, reporters, uh, foreign reporters who are actually on the ground, somebody like Nicholas Kristof, who's been on Tahrir Square. But I also uh, want to show that, that the stories that come that focus so clearly on recent sparks and that as if there is a kind of self-evident moral content to the protest movement related to that specific moment actually um, obscures the much longer prehistory that allowed these sparks to take off. And that's precisely what we are not getting from the media. And we're not getting it from Nicholas Kristof, although that's perhaps not his fault. He's very busy on the square. Um, that is, there is a, a long story about the relationship between corruption and authoritarian regimes. Why is it that authoritarian regimes become corrupt? I mean, there's, there's a, there are real histories here um, that the media is ill-prepared or unwilling to explore. Um, and then, on the other hand, the second kind of story actually is a big picture story, but it is also a 
big picture story that seems to be equally devoid of political content. Uh, recently in the New York Times, I saw this recently in a Thomas Friedman article, Charles Blow had a piece in the New York Times over the weekend. Um, there's a, a, a big story that's being told about changes in the global economy <clears throat> in which um, uh, in particular, the development of China, the growth of a, of a kind of consumer economy in China has uh, put enormous uh, price uh, pressures on global food markets, and that this has placed uh, uh, regimes all over the world um, uh, that have a, a kind of a authoritarian regimes with problematic relationships with their own population, uh, regimes that in many cases depend on imported food sources, that, that, that they're exposed to a kind of crisis. And this crisis emerges because of these shifts in the global economy. Now here, we have also the kind of absence of uh, uh, an analysis of the different local political circumstances in each regime that might explain why some of these protest movements happen, why they're successful in some places, and why they don't happen in others. Um, so I, maybe just uh, should give you an example. I, I think comparing Tunisia and Algeria in recent weeks um, will show that um, we, need, we need something in between these local stories with the kind of self-evident moral content about sparks and these big pictures. And it has to be something about long-term structures. It has to be something about the politics of these places over the last uh, decades. Now, what's interesting about the comparison between Algeria and Tunisia is that um, prior to December of 2010, Tunisia was famously quiet whereas Algeria had been having uh, riots uh, in, in, in many cities almost on a weekly basis for years. Um, and, uh, uh, and yet, um, the popular protest movement that, took, that began in December of 2010 in, in Tunisia brought the regime to its knees in a matter of weeks, um, whereas the rioting that took off in Algeria uh, at the same time, which spread um, to many Algerian cities um, uh, over the last couple of months, they went nowhere. The riots went nowhere, and the regime in Algeria has emerged unscathed from these protest movements. Um, and I was looking for sort of explanations of this, and I, it's, I, I've been convinced by some of the reporting that I've um, seen from Algeria that explains it largely as um, uh, the, the difference between the two nations largely in terms of the participation of groups from civil society in the popular movement. That is, the movement of protest in Tunisia, excuse me, in Tunisia um, very quickly absorbed actors from a, a wide spectrum of Tunisian society, including trade unions, both uh, socialist and communist trade unions, opposition parties, political dissidents of all kinds who emerge. These, some of these are groups that have been around for a long time that have been illegal, that emerge and are uh, quite quickly participating in this um, larger protest movement. In Algeria, this has not been the case. Um, the January 2011 riots were very similar to previous patterns of rioting. They focused on local authorities. It was young men tending to attack police stations, post offices. And even members of the small parliamentary opposition in Algeria denied that these riots had any political content. They, th they, they just said they're, they're part of this old iteration, old patterns of local unrest over food prices. They actually mentioned food prices as if that means it's not political. Now, um, and, and this is, in fact, in spite of the fact that Algeria has a much more open society than Tunisia. It has a relatively free press. Every once in a while, a journalist goes to prison, but it's not uniformly uh, uh, censored. There are legal trade unions. But these civil society actors simply don't get involved. Um, uh, the, the riots remain very local in their effects. Now, and, and one commentator that I've read has gone so far as to suggest that local unrest in Algeria has almost become ritualized in certain areas as a way for certain neglected areas to get the attention of the state. Um, that is, people will organize a riot if, they're, um, if, they, if they feel that they're, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if a construction project in their neighborhood um, is uh, not getting the attention that they want, they organize a demonstration. The riot is followed by a few days of brief attention in the national press. A commitment of resources comes from the government, and there's a subsequent period of calm. So there's a kind of way in which in Algeria, certain kinds of expression of unrest has be become part of a dialogue between um, uh, the population and the state. Um, 
So I'll leave it to others. I'm sure Susan Watts and others can explain uh, better than me why the actors from civil society became so, so involved so quickly in Tunisia and why Ben Ali's regime collapsed so quickly. Um, but I do want to suggest, I think here, and following up on some of the comments that others have had, that if we want to see a, a viable democratic movement emerging in these places in the Middle East, we are going to have to accept that, uh, that all of these actors should be present, and that includes the trade unions, it includes the, um, the, uh, uh, the Islamist organizations um, uh, the, the, of, of various tendencies and various commitments um, to be viable at all, at all terms, that uh, if they're not present, then we will simply have more of the same. I, I can ask some more questions about Algeria if you have questions, but I'll stop there in the hopes that you'll have time. How would Egyptians define, quote unquote, success of this revolution? How does an Egyptian or Tunisian vision of success contrast with American or Western ideas of success? <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. Um, you know, it, it, I have to say, it reminds me, uh, this is a very personal sort of thing, but it reminds me once when I was asked to participate in a, in a simulation uh, in the White House uh, that was a, a National Security Council simulation. I was asked to play both the Islamist movement and the Tunisian people at the same time. <laughs> I didn't. I, I, uh, I, I declined. I declined the whole thing. So I, I can't speak for the Egyptians at all, and I'm not sure that I could even try to uh, imagine myself into the, the Tunisian population. But I, I think that uh, some of the other comments, I think really from Mark's survey um, and, and some of the other comments uh, about the the hope for a, for a fair shake, the hope for um, uh, equal access into um, employment opportunities and other sorts of maybe more economic than political, but even also political uh, discourse, I think, would be um, one measure of success. Though I, I'm aware as I speak that my own point of reference in Tunisian society are people who are university educated, maybe um, high school teachers or university professors or professionals of one sort or another. And it's not clear to me that I'm, I could articulate what um, someone from the village of Kef that participated in setting the police station on fire last weekend. I, I'm not really sure that I, I know what for them uh, would mean success. What I fear is that uh, success may mean jobs for all um, and that those aren't going to be forthcoming and that there's going to be great displeasure and then a rallying um, on the personal personalistic side, perhaps after this uh, Tunisian general that has has gotten uh, so popular. So I, I'll stop there, but say simply, for many Tunisians, it's a more of a liberal model that isn't that different from what France has or, or the US has. But for many others, um, uh, it may be a far more simplistic one that will actually flip the, the Jasmine revolution over to the other direction. Oops. Yeah, I, I, I think I would just echo that. There are um, there isn't necessarily just one point of view, but I think the, the common element is uh, a government that they feel really cares about them and is accountable in some sense, that uh, there is some mechanism for holding that government accountable, and that they have a government that really is accountable, that, that, that really cares. And I think the, 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 the two points that I made based on when I was in Tunisia during their riots is uh, this, this notion of justice, that uh, if there are burdens, they're going to be shared. If there are opportunities, everybody's going to have equal access and, uh, what you, and, and decisions will be based on merit and what's good for the country. 
Uh, these are the kinds of stories that, that, that people were telling all the time about, about the corruption. And the, what resources available are not being squandered for jets and imported luxury cars and the benefit of a small consumer class, but they're being invested uh, in the country. And there'll be ups and downs. There'll always be some inequality, and corruption will always be to some extent everywhere. But that the main thrust is what we have uh, is being invested for the benefit of all over the long term. I believe things will be better for my kids, uh, and I believe that others are sharing the burden that I'm sharing, so I'm willing to be patient. I think, I think that organized around the, the, the notion of justice. It often expresses itself with the term dignity, but I don't think uh, that should be taken as some sort of a, a psychological factor that people are uh, psychologically problematic and we've got to kind of uh, raise their self-esteem. It's not that kind of dignity. It is that, but it's more fundamental. The, the, the country is really working on behalf of its people, and th that's the notion of justice that I think is central to all of this. With regard to um, both Egypt and Tunisia, I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is it's an oppositional movement, so it's against something. And very large numbers of people are involved in it from all kinds of social classes whose vision of the good society, as Susan said, would be quite diverse. But there are things that they agree upon, which is why these movements have occurred. One of the things they agree upon is that both Tunisia and Egypt uh, came to have over time growing out of that period of experimentation with state socialism of the 1960s, an increasingly authoritarian and corrupt elite at the top, which could be characterized as a mafia state. And uh, it was a crony state, it was nepotistic. In Tunisia, the nepotism was taken to the point that the U.S. cable traffic released by WikiLeaks suggests in 2008 that 50% of the economic elite of Tunisia was related <laughs> by, by blood or marriage to Ben Ali, to the dictator. Or his wife. Blood or marriage. Uh, so uh, the Trabolsi clan of his wife, of course, uh, were, were notorious. And, and while the uh, character of the elite in Egypt is not quite so narrow, there's still a lot of cronyism, a lot of nepotism, and, and Mubarak was grooming his son, Gamal, to be a successor. So my professor, uh, uh, um, Saadadine Ibrahim, uh, uh, got himself in trouble and actually was thrown in jail for three years, largely because he pointed this out. He said that the Arab republics of the post-colonial period have innovated. They've created a new form of government unknown to Aristotle, which, you know, Aristotle distinguished the monarchy and the aristocracy and, and the democracy or the republic. And he said that, that in Syria, uh, Hafez al-Assad had groomed his son Bashar to succeed him. The same things were going on in Yemen and in Egypt, that, that the Arabs had invented monarchpublicanism. Dynastic republicanism. And, and one of the things that people are protesting against in Egypt, and, and, and certainly uh, um, this, this comes into Tunisia in some ways as well, is a dynastic principle in republicanism, which is corrupt and nepotistic and cronyist in its, in its character. So in that regard, both movements have already to some extent succeeded, since that was one of the big objections, was the mafia state. And the remaining elites are trying to take advantage of the fact that that has succeeded. There won't be monarch publicanism in, in Egypt to then divide the public and say, well, OK, you've succeeded in what you want. But of course, there are a very large number of people who want more than simply the removal of the, of the, of the mafia state. They want an opening. They want equal opportunity. They, they want uh, more, more social equality and so forth. So there were quite a few questions about the following, but I'll just give you one representative. What effect on the Gaza and Israeli situation will be caused, or by what, what will be the effect on that by the current Egyptian unrest? Uh, Susan, Susan has the answer to this question. <laughs> um, well, I think it's uh, probably easiest to say that an awful lot remains to be determined. Uh, I, I, for what it's worth, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has recently issued a statement saying that uh, they would support the continuation of the peace treaty with, uh, uh, with Israel because it's in, in, in Egypt's interest. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard to predict, to be, to be serious about it. Um, an awful lot depends on uh, 
who comes to power. Uh, a lot depends on what the U.S. does, um, whether we end up playing a more constructive role than we have up to now. Uh, a lot has to do with what Israel does, uh, whether this uh, is, provides a sufficient incentive for Israel to engage in the peace process in a way that it hasn't before. Uh, anytime you start to talk about these things, you get all different points of view. I don't think today is the time for us to be arguing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and the Palestinians should have done this, and Israel should have done that, and we would probably get to that point pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the best guess is that probably we'll have more continuity than, uh, than change, at least in the short term. That would be my best guess, even though, as I say, it depends on an awful lot, and we really don't know. Um, I think it's unlikely. Uh, I'm just trying to be responsive. I, 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 I don't really feel that I know the answer. But um, I don't think we'll see any dramatic changes in uh, Egyptian policy in the short term. Uh, a real important question will be what happens on the border with Gaza and whether it's uh, more open. But uh, what happens in Gaza depends on a lot of things, uh, partly on uh, Palestinian politics, certainly on the Israeli siege, and whether there are other opportunities for uh, goods and services that are needed in Egypt to come in, in Gaza to come in. So um, I know I'm not being very responsive, but uh, I think that's where I am in thinking about it. Could, could I just add that, uh, as Mark said, it depends a lot on what happens. At the moment in Egypt, Hosni Mubarak hadn't had a vice president because he didn't want to designate a successor and he was grooming his son Gamal. But his response to this movement has been to appoint a vice president who is Omar Suleiman, uh, the former head of uh, military intelligence. Uh, military intelligence in Egypt deals with foreign countries, so he's the one who's been trying to track down al-Qaeda and kill them. Uh, he's been involved, in, as Nadine said, in rendition and torture of uh, uh, suspects, uh, uh, al-Qaeda suspects taken to Egypt by the CIA. Uh, and he has been the point man in negotiating with the Israelis and the Palestinians uh, in the so-called peace process. Uh, he has been behind a lot of the Egyptian cooperation with the Israeli blockade of the civilian population of Gaza, which is illegal in international law. So at the moment, the person who's responsible for the status quo in Egypt has become more powerful as a result of uh, the regime's reaction to these uh, uh, protests. Now, if uh, the protest movement can be dampened and, and tamped down over time, and uh, Omar Suleiman manages, as Mubarak clearly intends, uh, to become the ruler of Egypt down the road, uh, then that would argue for uh, status quo. If the protest movement continues to be vigorous and that eventuality is forestalled by the people and you get a political opening and someone like Amr Musa, who's the, the Secretary General of the Arab League, runs for president and wins, which is entirely plausible as a scenario, uh, then the Egyptian cooperation with the blockade of the civilian population of Gaza is over with. So uh, we're in early days to know how this is going to affect uh, the situation, if at all. OK, there are a, a, a number of questions, and I'll, I'll kind of combine uh, two here. Uh, this is for mostly for one, but uh, for the panel as a whole. Could you speak more on the role of the US and its backing of Mubarak and now Suleiman? That's, and I'll combine it with this question. How, we've often been told that this revolution is leaderless, that no obvious leaders are representing the revolutionaries or the, those opposing the regime. And I don't know if those questions are related. I think they are. Uh, do you want to respond to this? Well, the United States um, uh, began backing the uh, military regime in Egypt uh, in a big way uh, because of the Camp David uh, peace accords uh, in 1978-79. Uh, and as a result of those uh, uh, accords, the U.S. Congress uh, rewarded Egypt and Israel for making peace with one another because their wars were a huge headache for the United States. Uh, by giving uh, uh, Israel about $3 billion a year in direct aid, 
and all kinds of other perquisites. Uh, and Egypt, about $2 billion a year in direct aid, half of it military and half of it civilian. Now, that has fallen to, I think, about $1.3 billion last year. Uh, but it's an enormous amount of money over the past uh, 30 years. And um, uh, that money uh, has been important to the regime's stability, uh, its ability to uh, uh, keep its uh, military uh, relatively strong in the absence of wars. Uh, and, uh, of course, it involves officer training. Uh, uh, it, it, it involves uh, uh, other kinds of training on the U.S. part, and training for counterterrorism, which inevitably is useful in repressing ordinary people as well. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, has backed this regime with money, with training, uh, with political support, in part uh, because it uh, has become a pillar of the post-Camp David uh, uh, settlement in the Middle East, that Egypt is uh, one of only two uh, Arab countries with a formal peace treaty with Israel, although many other Arab countries have some kind of informal relationship. Uh, and Tunisia had uh, uh, until the late 90s for a while. Uh, but, um, yeah, Qatar, uh, for instance, is a place that the, uh, and, Mor and Morocco are, are places that uh, the Israelis, behind the scenes at least, have, have a fair amount to do. Um, but, um, but Egypt is, is important to the U.S. for that reason. Uh, the Suez Canal uh, is a major artery of world trade. 7.5 percent of all the trade in the world goes through the Suez Canal. Uh, about 10 percent of the world's petroleum, and of course it's, it's a higher percentage of seaborne trade. Uh, so, you know, petroleum supplies are tight, and were the canal to be closed and the, the ships have to go around the Cape of Good Hope again, uh, this would have an impact on, on world uh, uh, petroleum futures markets, uh, I mean, it, to the extent that, you know, it could even push some countries back into recession. So um, the U.S. has uh, many reasons for which it has backed this regime. Uh, it has been relatively uninterested in uh, rocking the boat or in democratization. It has had some contacts with opposition figures. Uh, and there was a brief moment in 2005 when the Bush administration was pushing Hosni Mubarak to open up the system uh, because of their emphasis uh, uh, on, on, on democratization, although it was a very um, selectively enforced uh, uh, theory of democratization, uh, not applied to Musharraf in Pakistan. And uh, Condi Rice went to Cairo in 2005 and, and criticized Hosni Mubarak for not allowing people to run against him. He was having referendums on his presidency, which, of course, you can't lose a referendum. You can do worse or better. Uh, but uh, there's no opponent. So uh, he responded by uh, letting Ayman Noor, the, the head of the Tomorrow Party, uh, out of prison and letting him run against him uh, and, and letting him get 7 or 8 percent of the vote, uh, after which he put Ayman Noor back in prison. Uh, and that was the extent of the Bush administration's ability to influence uh, Egypt. He moreover let the Muslim Brotherhood in, in the parliamentary elections of 2006 win about 88 seats out of uh, then 454. And this was a message to Washington that that's what comes if you bother us too much, is you get the Muslim Brotherhood. And after, after 2006, we never heard anything more from the Bush administration about democratization in Egypt. Um, I think this, this relates to the question that we all avoided that was actually the second half of the first question about what would be success from the, for the U.S. We all said mm -hmm. we can't speak for the Egyptians and the Venetians, mm -hmm. but we did our best and we've, we're unwilling to speak for ourselves. Um, I think this is a question that the U.S. administration is struggling with and, and, and hasn't decided. Is the, is the status quo as it has been? And to the extent that it could be resurrected in some moderate, in some modest form, some some somewhat changed form, but more or less the same, the one that Juan just described, is that is really what is in our interest, and that outcome would be successful. Um, that's not my personal view. I think uh, the relationship we have and the standing we have and the appreciation we have by uh, by ordinary men and women in these countries is in our interest. And I think the administration is struggling to see if it can work its way toward agreeing with that proposition and what the implications of it would be. 
But the counterargument is uh, you might have said the present situation is unstable. Uh, you could have said that 30 years ago because a lot of the conditions that uh, gave rise to the uprising now maybe in some cases weren't quite as intense, but basically were, were present, as I described, with the, the, the demonstrations in the 80s. And that was in Algeria, and that was in Jordan. And it was also in Egypt at the time. Uh, so uh, that uh, status quo that, uh, that we don't like and where uh, Egyptian friends would say to me, when you go back to the U.S., uh, give my love to the American people and tell the president to go to hell. Uh, I heard that more than once. Uh, first time I thought, well, it's just, but I've heard it a number of times from different places. Uh, so I think uh, there is a real question about whether uh, our longer term interests are with the people of these countries and we want to put ourselves on that side, or whether that's hopelessly naive and it's really mixing up what our real interests are. Um, I think. I think I made clear what my own view is, but that's uh, that's an issue that the U.S. is struggling with, and I think uh, we'll have trouble resolving in a way that will be totally satisfactory. Could I slip in something here? The question was really about Egypt, but I think Tunisia serves as a really interesting contrast case, and um, the, the Tunisia obviously is is not near does not occupy nearly as much space in U.S. foreign policy and U.S. interests, and that's why it forms a contrast case. You don't have um, the Israel-Palestine issue looming in the background. You don't have a large military uh, concern there, and so the number of people who are tracking Tunisia is much smaller. And I think that it's fair to say that that the U.S. actually played a passively positive role in. Tunisia uh, over quite a quite a period of time. Um, there, there's both a, a glass half full and a glass half empty side to that. The WikiLeaks uh, accounts of opulence by the uh, the um, the ruling family, both sides, um, his and hers. Uh, I think really once that, uh, as it was circulated on Facebook and other social media, that really helped um, provide evidence that people suspected was there all along, and and the. The frankness with which American diplomats reported what was going on behind the scenes, I think, was actually really appreciated. And though WikiLeaks was a fairly new phenomenon, and the, the accounts were only from the last two or three years, um, there are anecdotes that go back 15, 20 years of Americans sort of telling the truth. The, that's the half full side. The half empty side was that they didn't really do anything about it, and they tolerated a regime that they knew was increasingly autocratic and depended upon it for cooperation in the the so-called war against terror, and that takes us back to another theme that has been running through the panel, and that is the U.S. obsession with, um, with Islamism that it sees in monolithic terms, and, and all of the incredible missed opportunities for appreciating nuances in that movement, and Tunisia had arguably the most, um, ra the most moderate form of it, the, the form that was most compatible with a Western style democracy and rather than tipping, uh, use, using American influence to help integrate um, Islam into a pluralistic um, uh, political system, we went the other direction. And so I think that's the huge challenge. And it's a challenge not just to the government, to, but to our people to think about Islamism in forms that are other than uh, jihadist, uh, you know, forms of Al Qaeda, etc. Okay, I have. Uh, I'll do one more question, and it has to do with media coverage, American media coverage. And this question asks for uh, basically an evaluation of how the U.S. media has covered this event, um, and are we seeing? What are the consequences of the massive cuts in journalistic organizations in the U.S. and so and and the effect this is having on the coverage? You certainly saw. I should pick this up. Um, you certainly saw that we had to play catch up early on, right? I mean, there have been cuts. We don't have the foreign correspondence, uh, but we got there relatively quickly. Um, to me, the question is always sort of when you're assessing the quality of media coverage, it's a, a question of sort of versus what. Uh, I think we often have this uh, idea that there is this perfect truth that the media could be uncovering and transmitting to the people 
and that that would somehow be very informative and change U.S. policy in a positive way. But it turns out when you talk to people what, what that, that truth is, is variable, right? It, 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 that isn't a constant thing that we could know. Um, you know, so to me, there's an interaction here between the media coverage and the audience, right? And I think what's been interesting about this uh, has been the sustained attention that the American people have been willing to pay to this. As long as people will tune in, CNN will cover this into, into 2015 if people will watch. Um, so, you know, that's what to me is, is the surprising part of it, is that you have this sustained attention to relatively hard news. Um, as you, we've all seen this unfold with Iraq and with various other things, as there is sustained attention, they bring out everyone who's an expert on the matter, and then they run out of everyone who's an expert, and they bring on everybody else. So you get depth as long as you have attention, and I think that's what we've seen here. Can I add to that? Yeah, I, I, I think um, we have more information about this than we can deal with already. One of the things that struck me, though, is the way in which the um, mainstream corporate media is, in fact, not very inventive on its ability to use new kinds of social media to get contact with people in other places. Let me just tell you a story. A colleague of mine in the history department has a son who's a graduate student in at UCLA in Los Angeles, who had some experience in Cairo. He lived in Cairo, involved in various development projects. And, and at the beginnings of the protest movement, he, he was calling people on the phone to find out what was going on, find out how the protest movement was being organized. And with their permission, he put the contents of those cell phone conversations online. He, he started a Twitter account. And pretty soon, he had so many hits that he crashed the server he was using. Um, he, got some, he got some friends to. Um, uh, some, some, some friends, I guess, through the university to give him some larger server space. Um, meanwhile, he got more telephone numbers from more people in Cairo. And um, by the end of the week, he had a team from Al Jazeera and from Fox News show up at his apartment in Los Angeles to try and figure out how he was generating so much traffic. Um, through the, and so this is an example of how somebody, I mean, he's just working apparently with a borrowed Mac with a cracked screen that he got from his brother. <laughs> and he has managed to create all of this information coming from the people in the square, it seems to me that the mainstream media could use a le take a lesson from that. Yeah, could, could I just add that um, the, 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 the corporate media in the United States blew off Tunisia, did not cover it at all. And, and that, I mean, Ben Wiedemann actually managed to get to Tunis with a camera crew. <laughs> And uh, I never saw him uh, report. Maybe he did one or tw once or twice. It means the producers back in Atlanta were declining his reports because they thought that uh, some starlet being uh, supposedly rehabilitated was was going to bring in more money. Uh, and, and I think, we, you know, I'm just outraged that the bottom line for our media coverage of important events, and if you didn't cover Tunisia, how would you have any idea about Egypt? Uh, and, and the bottom line for important events has now become uh, how much uh, advertising revenue the news will make. I, I can remember a time at which the, the, the national media considered news to be a lost leader. They didn't expect it to make a lot of money. They had bureaus in places like Cairo. And the idea that you can just parachute these uh, uh, guys in and they can cover these stories with, without having been there is crazy. And the idea that we should de depend on corporate media for our news when, when, when the question for them is, will it sell more tampons, is, is just a non-starter. And we are being very badly <laughs> served by this situation. Okay. Uh, the final thing we're going to do is Mark Tesla's going to tell his joke because I got I got three requests for Mark Tesla's joke. Okay. But before doing that, I do want to thank the School of Social Work very much for accommodating our request to the space and assisting with our technolo technological needs. I want to thank you all for coming. Mark will have the final word. All right. So this is this is uh, a joke that I was told by Egyptians, uh, and it's a, it's a harsh joke, and I'm going to. Try to tell it in a shortened version. Uh, as Juan was saying, the Egyptians have great humor. We should tell our stories about uh, Sadat and about Nasser. Sometimes in, in my Middle East course, I tell the joke about each one to give a sense of how the different regimes look to Egyptians. So this is going to be a shortened version, uh, which will maybe lose some of the uh, impact. Uh, well, um, 
Mubarak, you know, uh, was uh, always uh, interested in uh, having his uh, ego puffed up by his ministers, uh, and his ministers uh, knew this, of course. So uh, one of them came in and said, uh, "Mr. President, we've got uh, a wonderful, uh, uh, a wonderful project to uh, uh, to show the Egyptian people how many wonderful things you are you are doing for them. Uh, we're going to uh, have a brand new postage stamp, and your picture is going to be prominently on the front. Only your picture on the front." And Mubarak says, well, uh, that doesn't sound like such a big deal. He says, well, no, no, but the deal is that we are going to make it here. You know, we used to have to go to Sicily for the dyes and the special glue that was needed. We would have to go to uh, France for that. And, and, and so this is going to be entirely produced in Egypt, and, um, and it will be a symbol of our, our our technological ability uh, and our entry. This was this was when I was living there in the, in the 80s. So maybe postage stamp isn't the big deal today, uh, but um, this will be a, of our ability to be self-sufficient, independent, and in, in developing and prosperous. And what will the Egyptians know? This means your picture will be on the front. So uh, every few days, uh, Mubarak is asking the minister, you know, when am I going to see this stamp? We're waiting. We're waiting. It's a great idea. When are we going to see the stamp? Uh, and finally, after several weeks of this, Mubarak says, I want that stamp. I'm not going to wait any longer. And the minister says, well, actually, we've had the stamp for a while. There's uh, a bit of a problem with it. It seems it doesn't stick. Uh, and uh, he says, well, what are people going to think that we can't even produce glue that sticks? Uh, Mr. President, it's not the glue. We can't get people to spit on the back of it.